Welcome back to our infectious disease modules. Welcome to the color presentation. My name is Juanita Prieto and I work at the Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health. Today, we're gonna talk about cholera. In our learning objectives, we will learn the basic epidemiology, understand the pathogenesis, and identify clinical presentation. Also, we will learn basic treatment and prognosis for the disease. Cholera is an acute diarrheal illness caused by an infection of the intestine with the toxigenic bacterium Vibrio cholera, serogroup O1 or O139. An estimated 2.9 million cases and 25,000 deaths occur every year around the world. The infection is often mild or without symptoms, but can sometimes be severe. Approximately one in 10 infected persons will have severe disease, characterized by profuse watery diarrhea, vomiting, and leg cramps. In these people, rapid loss of body fluids leads to dehydration and shock, without treatment that can occur without, within hours. So let's overview cholera disease. Cholera is an acute diarrheal illness caused by infection of the intestine with the bacterium Vibrio cholera and is spread by ingestion of contaminated food or water. The infection is often mild or without symptoms, but sometimes it can be severe and life-threatening. Cholera is highly transmissible. Dramatic clinical and public health presentation is one of the characteristics. It affects all age groups and is fatal if not properly treated. Cholera is what we call an indicator disease. Other enteric pathogens like Salmonella, Shigella, or E. coli are transmitted through the same routes, routes as cholera. Together, they cause additional illnesses and deaths. So the pathology of Vibrio cholera, it, it belongs to the Vibrio nasive family. It's a short gram negative rod-shaped oxidase positive respiratory and fermented metabolism organism. There are more than 200, 200 different serogroups of Vibrio cholera, which are distinguished based on the structure of a protein called the O antigen in the bacterium cell wall. Several of these groups are pathogenic in humans. However, only two serogroups of Vibrio cholera, O1 and O139, sometimes called the Bengal serogroup, are known to cause cholera. Pathogenic O1 and O139 have the ability to produce cholera toxin, a type of enterotoxin that affects the intestinal cells. Pathogenic organisms in the O1 serogroup have caused the majority of the cholera outbreaks and are subdivided into two biotypes, classical and l -tour. These two biotypes each contain two serotypes called Inawa and Ogawa, which are differentiated based on their biochemical properties, namely their expression of the specific antigens. Inawa and Ogawa serotypes both express a common cholera antigen known as simply as A antigen. However, only Ogawa expresses cholera antigen B and only Inawa expresses cholera antigen C. The classical biotype was responsible for most, if not all, of the sixth grade cholera pandemics that swept through the world in the 19th century and early 20th. The seventh pandemic, which began in the mid 20th century and, continu and that continues today, is caused by the l bio biotype. So let's go a little bit more in detail with the l biotype. l biotype possesses two characteristics that are of great epidemiological significance. First, it's a much hardier organism than the classical one, and it can survive for long periods of time in aquatic environments. Second, many people infected with the l biotype experience only mild symptoms or no, or no symptoms at all. Seriously, illness, ill patients are highly effective transmitters of cholera, but persons with mild or no symptoms are more likely to travel, thereby also playing a crucial role in the spread of the disease. As barriers to commerce and to personal travel despair, the potential for disease to be transmitted rapidly from one continent to another increase. So let's take a pause and let's, let's consider that 70% of people with this biotype of cholera are asymptomatic. The strain can survive for a long period of time in aquatic environment and the severity of the disease. 
what policy, taking this into account, what policy or program suggestions do you have for an area where cholera is endemic? So going along with that question, let's talk about transmission. A person can get cholera by drinking water or eating food contaminated with the cholera bacterium. Large epidemics are often related to fecal contamination of water supplies or street vended foods, most likely to, uh, to be found and spread in places with inadequate water treatment, poor sanitation, and inadequate hygiene. Also important is that brackish and marine waters are natural environments for the etiologic agents of cholera and the Vivir cholera serogroup O1 and O139, there are not no animal hosts for Vivir cholera. However, the bacteria attach themselves to easily to the shells of crabs, shrimps, and other self shellfish, which can be a source for human infection when eaten raw or undercooked. People who are more likely to be exposed to cholera include healthcare personnel, treating cholera patients, Cholera response workers and travelers in an area of active cholera transmission who cannot or do not always follow the safe food and water precaution and personal hygiene measures. Approximately one in 10 of infected persons will have severe cholera, which in the early stages includes profuse water diarrhea, also called rice water stools, vomiting, rapid heart rate, loss of skin elasticity, dry mucous membranes, low blood pressure, thirst, muscle cramps, and rest restlessness or irritability. Person with, persons with severe cholera can develop acute renal failure, severe electrolyte imbalance, and coma if infant treated. Severe dehydration can rapidly lead to shock and death even in hours. Profuse diarrhea produced by cholera patient contains large amount of infectious vivir cholera bacteria that can infect others if ingested. And when these bacteria contaminate water or food, it will lead to additional, additional infections. So who is more likely to have poor outcomes? Individuals with acloridia, which is the absence of hydrochloric acid in the digestive stomach juices, and people with blood type O, chronic medical conditions patients, and those without ready access to rehydration therapy and medical services are more likely to have severe disease from cholera and suffer for poor outcome. It is almost impossible to distinguish a single patient with cholera from a patient infected with another pathogen that causes acute watery diarrhea without testing a stool sample. A review of a clinical feature of multiple patients who are part of a suspected outbreak of acute water diarrhea can be helpful in identifying cholera because of the rapid spread of the disease. In the diagnosis, the clinical aspect we can see, as we mentioned before, severe watery, watery diarrhea, vomiting, prior consumption of seafood, loss of appetite, especially interest in endemic areas. The differential diagnosis, this is very important to know, uh, could be bacterial food poisoning, viral gastroenteritis, and enterooxygenic E. coli infection. So how do we confirm that is cholera infection uh, through laboratory? Isolation and identification of Bavier cholera serogroup O1 and O139 by culture of a stool specimen remains the gold standard for the laboratory diagnosis of cholera. Motile organism and gram-negative rods are the key findings, and carry blare media is always used or usually used for ideal transport. And the selective thiosulfate citrate bile salts, agar, also known as TCBS, is ideal for isolation and identification. In areas with limited or no laboratory testing, the Crystal VC dipstick rapid test can provide an early warning to public health officials. However, the sensitivity and specificity of this test is not optimal. Therefore, it is recommended that fecal specimens that test positive for Vibrio cholera by the Crystal VC dipsticks are always confirmed using traditional culture-based methods suitable for the isolation and identification of the Bavier cholera bacteria. As for treatment, cholera patients should be evaluated and treated quickly. With proper treatment, even severely ill patients can be saved. The primary goal is the restoration of lost fluids and salts. 
Severely dehydrated patients are at risk of shock and require the rapid administration of intravenous fluids. Mass administration of antibiotics is not recommended. It has no proven effect on the spread of cholera and contributes to increasing antimicrobial resistance. Rapid access to treatment is essential during a cholera outbreak. Zinc, which we will talk more in detail in the following slides, is an important adjunctive therapy for children under five. This re helps reduce the duration of diarrhea and may prevent future episodes of other causes of acute watery diarrhea. For younger population, breastfeeding should also be promoted. Dehydrated patients who can sit up and drink should be given oral rehydration solution immediately. Always encourage the patient to drink and offer solution frequently. frequently. Patients who vomit should be administered ORS by nasogastric tube. Oral rehydration salts should be made with safe water if possible. Patients with severe dehydration, stupor, coma, uncontrollable vomiting, or extreme fatigue that prevents drinking should be rehydrated intravenously. The best, the best to use is Ringer lactate. An acceptable is normal saline. Never use dextrose solution. Recommended for moderately and severely ill patients, antimicro antimicrobial therapy, it's a good idea. Antibiotics and zinc are the only drugs to be given as treatment for vomiting or diarrhea. Zinc, as we mentioned before, reduces the severity and duration of diarrhea. 10 to 20 milligrams a day are the recommended dose. Antibiotic recommendations based on the resistant profile of cholera are made from the Haiti outbreak isolated strains. So the prognosis. Cholera prognosis depends on the sever severity of the dehydration and how fast treatment starts. The mortality rates are as high as 60% during large outbreak if treatment is not available. Treatment protocol can reduce mortality rates to 1% if initiated immediately. Currently, there are, there are three World Health Organization pre-qualified oral, oral coral vaccine, OCV, Ducoral, Sancol, and Elvicol. All three vaccines require two doses for full prote protection. Ducrol is administered with a buffer solution, and it requires 150 mill milliliters of clean water. It can be given to all individuals of their age of two, and there must be a minimum of seven days in between doses. Children aged two and five require a third dose. Ducrol is important to remember because it's mainly used for travelers. Two doses of Ducrol provide the protection against cholera for two years. Sancol and Elvicol are essentially the same vaccine produced by two different manufacturers. They do not require a buffer solution for administration, which makes easier if we are in a low resource setting. They are given to all individuals over the age of one year. There must be a minimum of two weeks in between each dose. Two doses of Sancol and Elvicol provide the protection against cholera for three years, while one dose provides short-term protection. Remember that oral cholera, oral cholera vaccines should be used in areas with endemic cholera, in humanitarian crises with high risk of cholera, and during cholera outbreaks, always in conjunction with other cholera prevention and control strategies. So to summarize our presentation, we know that cholera is an acute diarrheal disease that can kill within hours if left untreated. Most infected persons have no or mild symptoms and can be successfully treated with oral rehydration solution. Severe cases will need rapid treatment with intravenous fluids and antibiotics, and provision of safe water and sanitation is critical to control transmission of cholera and other waterborne diseases. Safe oral cholera vaccines should be used in conjunction with improvements in water and sanitation to control cholera outbreaks and for prevention in areas known to be high risk of cholera. Let's move to a case study. A 24-year-old woman is brought to a hospital in Sierra Leone by her husband. She is too weak to walk, her mouth and tongue are very, very dry, and her pulse is weak. Her husband states that she had a sudden onset of diarrhea and vomiting, vomiting last night with increased frequency throughout the night. She denies abdominal pain and she is febrile. 
So you have again two questions. What is the likely diagnosis and the differential diagnosis and how you should be treating this patient?